The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Um, my name is Shiri Cabral and this is White Hat Google Hacking MySQL. Um, I am a senior database admin slash architect, the A stands for both things, at Mozilla. And uh, that's my website and my tweet, Twitter name and all that, whatever. So what is White Hat Google Hacking? Well, it's hacking. Y'all know what hacking is. Um, the good kind, not the cracking kind. Using Google, um, so you're using Google to do this hacking and it's white hat, meaning you're the good guys. So you're basically trying to find out things about your own systems or like a friend system, but not like trying to break in and steal you know, information. So where to start? Well, the first thing you can do is, is to do some searching. So for example, um, this website is the, uh, the Google Hacks database, GHDB. It's at Hackers for Charity. It's, I don't know what johnny.ihackstuff.com is. I think it, they were taken over by the, the Hackers for Charity. And so this is the, the Google hacking database. Um, so if you wanted to do something, you know, you start clicking here and looking at things. For example, you go to like error messages and then, you know, find in page for MySQL. Okay, here's, a, here's an error message uh, from MySQL. Here's a MySQL error with query. So you click on this little information link and you say, okay, what's this? MySQL error with query. Admin rates this a two out of 10. This is a generic uh, MySQL message. So depending on the actual message, you can keep clicking through it. You can actually, this now does a Google search for it. So the thing is, this will show up like on a web page. You know, if you've ever like had a web page, you can't connect to the database, it's unable to connect to the database, that kind of thing, you can get some information. So this is actually going to Google and looking at things. So we can see this, this thing that had um, this, this error, what is it, MySQL error with query, MySQL error, well, it's not here anymore, but is it cache? It's not cache, but you can see MySQL error with query. Select C.C item as item ID. Like it's basically showing you the query here. Um, so this is one way to use, you know, Google hacking with MySQL. Here's another one from a similar one. Um, I dot number as item ID. You know, star from nucleus blog. So you know, it's kind of neat. Nucleus seems to have this a lot. Um, so you can start kind of like looking around and just, you know. You're a hacker, you probably like doing this kind of stuff and just clicking around or whatever. So the, uh, the Hackers for Charity has that Google Hacks database right on there and you can play around and, and look at some good stuff. So that's kind of a, gives you a sense of like what is Google hacking. And you can like put your site into, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but you guys probably already know, you can put your site into my, you can do site colon shiri.com and search for things. Um, security advisories, so you can find things like that. You know, like does MySQL have a security advisory? Does it have some kind of message? So you can actually um, go to a website and do something. Um, do you have powered by WordPress on your site? And if so, then people can say, oh, WordPress 5.7 had a vulnerability. I know about that. Um, and then you know, companies themselves might have um, specific things. Like if you say, oh, we have all of our stuff managed by X company, and X company has a breach. So it's all about what do you put publicly out there on the net. Google's terms of service. So here's something interesting. Google recently changed their terms of service a couple months ago, um, as you probably know. Right now, the Google terms of service is very, very vague, um, but pretty much says you can do whatever you want. It used to say you have to be over 18, you have to be 18 or over, you can't do any automation, um, you can't do, there's a lot of stuff that you can't do. Um, that's not in the terms of service anymore. So that's actually kind of interesting that they took that stuff out. I mean, it does say like, you don't, don't do anything illegal, but it doesn't really say no automation. So I think they've gotten better about rate limiting, but that used to be in the terms of service. This is something that if you really want to do this for reals, check the terms of service when you start, because six months from now, it might be a different term of service as well. But the interesting thing is you can go to the past versions. Um, you know, so right now it's, uh, oh, this is right behind here. The Google terms of service is very kind of human readable and everything you know, don't misuse our services. Um, it doesn't give you any ownership or IP rights. Our services display some content that's not Google's and it's not ours. So it's a very small, you know, very short, very easy to read, that kind of thing. And it just basically says, you know, don't do anything wrong. Uh, but if you go to past versions, this is where you get to, um, to the big, long legal document 
Um, and there are some things where it says, you know, provision of the services, use of the services by you. Uh, you may be required to provide information about yourself for registration. You agree not to, yeah, you agree not to access or attempt to access any of the services by any means other than through the interface that is provided by Google, unless you've been specifically allowed to do so in a separate agreement. Um, you specifically agree not to access or attempt to access any of the services through automated means, including the use of scripts or web crawlers, and shall ensure that you comply with the instructions set out in a ro any robots.txt file present on the services. That's no longer in the terms of service. It used to be. It just says now don't misuse the services. Is automation misuse? Maybe, maybe not. Like, I guess if you're using it for bad, then that's fine, which is good. You shouldn't kill the method. You should just kill the intent behind it, right? Like Napster wasn't necessarily bad as a file sharing service, it's just everyone was using it for bad things. So it's kind of interesting to see what's not in it anymore. Um, but it used to have all that other stuff in, in the terms of service, so it's kind of interesting and I wonder if it's still really kind of there or not. Um, but just make sure legally that you're not doing something illegal. So if you're gonna be doing white hat Bing hacking or white hat Yahoo hacking using those search engines instead of Google, make sure that you are not violating the terms of service because the last thing you want to do is go to jail. Password hashes. So was anyone here in my MySQL security talk? No? Awesome. So um, there are hash dictionaries out there. So for example, what's this password here? Well, you don't know. Um, and no, it's, it's not password. I don't think it's password. The cool part is, is that since this is on the web, the first hit for this is my, um, my website with the uh, thing. So here, this is cool. This is hash hash dot in, um, and this is pages you know zero through three hundred and seven. There's ton, tons of pages to go through. Um, it has an MD5 sum, the MD5 of MD5, the MySQL password, and the SHA1 of you know things like Curtis, Thunderboy, Hail Hail, Top Cat, but also things like one two two seven four tooth and L zero four one and Orange twenty two. So it's not just dictionary words. It's probably they they stole some password lists or they have some algorithms going. So if you look here, it's actually Penguin. That's what this, I did a find in page for that and it came up as Penguin. And this is actually a real example. There was some application whose username was Penguin, which in retrospect, and I was like, oh, let me see if I can figure out what this password is. And I typed into the Google and I got it. So it's not just things like, oh, the password hash of password. That's my dad calling. He knows I'm doing a presentation, so he's probably calling. Um, so that's kind of interesting where you can actually reverse engineer a password, not by using a password cracker, but just by using Google, which I think is kind of cool. What else can you do? So how to use Google? Um, I'm going to go through this a little fast because I'm pretty sure you guys probably know this stuff. Wild cards are star and dot. Um, you might not have known wild cards. So if you want something like uh, secure versus security, you can type S-E-C-U-R star. And that you know will kind of fill in the rest for you. Although Google is pretty good. If anyone was at Bruce's talk, not Bruce's, Richard Hip's talk um, the other day about full text search, he was talking about how um, they kind of get the base of the word there. Um, you can search different media types. You can search images only, or you can search news articles or blogs. Um, and then there's also a Boolean search, so you can say like plus this, minus that. Um, you can use ands and ors and all that kind of stuff. Google Basics, uh, actually this is a little out of date. I think it's a 15 word limit now. Let's see. Um, I wonder what the limit is for Google's search terms. It used to be 10. It might have changed by now. Uh, let's see. No, it might be more unlimited. I thought it was like 15 or something, because it used to say like showing, showing results for the first 10 words or something. Um, so that may, not be, um, that may not be in effect anymore. And is assumed. So basically when I typed in that whole sentence, it's assuming that I wanted I and wonder. So it's still kind of a Boolean search. Um, you can do or with the pipe. So you can say foo or bar. That's how you do it. Um, and there's a whole list of operators. Yes, I can close that. Um, there's a whole list of operators that you can use with Google. Um, and there's a whole cheat sheet on it, and we can go to it. But things like you can do the site. Oops. Let's 
dun, dun. No, oh, that's an errors. Yes, it is. Is my slide wrong? Help, oh, help operators and help cheat sheets. So here's um, help, op oh, I see, help operators. Oh, that's operators.html. I'll be able to follow. So this is, you know, if you could do a phrase search exactly as is with quotes around it. You can search within a specific site with site colon. You put a negative. You fill in the blanks with wildcards. And you have the or operator. There are exceptions and punctuation that's ignored. So it shows you that. Um, and then the cheat sheet is what I really wanted to show you. Which goes to the same thing, apparently. I think it didn't used to. Let me change that on the slide, because it's not important. Um, the site does matter. So if you're Google hacking for your site only, you don't just want to type stuff into Google. You want to type stuff with like site colon .com. Um, And see, this stuff used to be there, file type versus in URL. So you could actually search for specific file types. You can say file type colon PHP, file type colon BMP for bitmaps, or PNG for portable something graphics files. Um, versus in URL. So you might want to say, I want to get PHP files. Should you say where file type is PHP or where in URL is PHP? Might be a little different. If you're doing something like HTML, you don't want to say in URL HTML because there might be HTM files or CSS files might render as HTML. Um, and these are, these are all called Google dorks, by the way. The, the kind of the, the search term you use to Google hack your site is called a Google dork. There you go. That's useless trivia for you. One day it'll be in some quiz show. So if you do, you can do something like this, site www.shiri.com, in URL, question mark ID equals, and then a range search. So the dot dot is range, one to 10, 100,000. Um, and if you do that, you would find, theoretically, if I had any, anything where it says no uh, ID, oops, I would have to put it into Google. Um, it's searching there. So you can actually, well, it's not on shiri.com, but you can go out and see who, who does have that here. So this is Woodbury Common Premium Outlets. It knows this is actually an, uh, an outlet in Massachusetts, which is kind of funny. Or maybe it's New Jersey. No, Rentham Village is in, anyway. So if you, see, if you can see this, it says premium outlets, outlet.asp, question mark, ID equals seven. So if you wanted to see, because now I can, I can go here, and I can, uh, I can do this, and I can say, oh, I wonder what's artic what Article 8 is about. Um, and you actually used to be able to do this um, when Percona had their conference. When you submitted the um, your sessions to approve it, you could actually do this. You could, like, when you had your node or whatever, because they were using um, Drupal. Uh, Drupal, they had it was like you know slash node slash whatever, and you know so it was like slash node slash 100 was mine. And a friend of mine pointed out that you could actually go to like node 101, and you could see other people's, and you could do the whole thing. So I told Percono about it, and they fixed it. But it's it's kind of funny to be able to you know obviously who cares if I go to Article 9 or I go to Article 10 on this premium outlets. So this is Rentham Premium, so I'm getting a different one every time. Um, but it's kind of neat to see that you can actually do that um, and look for it on your site to see if someone can put like ID number one, ID number two, things like that to try to hack your site. So the range is pretty useful here. It, most people know about site already. Um, in URL, you may not have known, and also um, the dot dot for the range. So common paths. Um, so what are some vulnerable locations, some common paths, like if you're using a, a CMS, content management? Um, one of the things about open source is a double-edged sword in this kind of a way. You know, having a default password is kind of a double-edged sword because you want a password, but if it's a default password, everyone's just going to know it. And with open source, you can see what tables are named. You can see what's there. And um, it's kind of a double-edged sword because for security, it's a lot easier to uh, figure some things out because all you have to do is read the source code. Um, usually, it's a lot better for security because a lot of people are hacking it. It's not any different for proprietary software. It's not any different for proprietary software yeah, is the so comment. You just make the, the proprietary software makes the assumption that your default password or their password is going to be supported in some way. So you just have right, they'll document their secret. default passwords or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not even that. It's not just like passwords. It's things like table names. You know, It's a little harder to figure out. Obviously, table names, somebody can look in to see it. but. Yeah. 
Right. For any popular product, you can find this kind of thing. But I mean, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of programs out there, and some are open source and some aren't. So, in the general case, yes. But you're right. Specifically, you know, if you figure out what Oracle's default username and password is, it's not that hard to do. You know, Scott Tiger or whatever. Yeah, Paychecks had that. Right. Right. So yeah, the idea is. The right. I mean, it's 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 less about an obscure obscure versus a used program. Right. Because because a. Um, what Josh was saying was a, a uh, more, sec more obscure or non-open source software um, might not care. So they might think that they have it they're, that they're safe because you can't read the code, but they put it in a file that you can crack. So um, it, you know, it is putting it out there in the open though does make it. It, it is good because it makes it more obvious, right? You, if you say, okay, everything's out there in the open, I have to worry about it, as opposed to, oh, don't worry about it. It's closed. Who cares? Um, so, so here are some things to try if you really want. <laughs> you really want to cause some damage in URL delete.php question ID equals. <laughs> um, you know, link private.company.com. Um, when, I, when I started working for Mozilla, it was really awesome because we were really open about a lot of things. And so I went looking for a Mozilla slide template. So I searched in Google for Mozilla slide template. And uh, I got here to wiki.mozilla.org. Look, it's, and you can see I've clicked it before. Um, there's also HTML slides. So I can download a slide template right here. Because our intranet is public, right? We have a wiki that's public. And this is public on purpose. Um, but if I wanted to see like, anything about Socorro and our internal, you might, I'd say, might say site, um, and this is a little dangerous because I haven't done this before, intranet.mozilla. Is it org or .com? Intranet.mozilla.org. Oops. Hmm? What'd you say? Yeah, no, it was a question. It was a question, but I answered it. So site intranet.mozilla.org, and let's try MySQL. And it did not match any documents because intranet is our private intranet. And if I go there, I, you'll see I'll have to log in. I hope I, if, if I'm not already logged in, .mozilla.org. Yeah, see, authentication required. So. Yeah, we Mozilla requires you to have passwords that are at least twelve characters long, and have at least two character classes of lowercase, uppercase, or lowercase special character or uppercase special character. So, it not yet. We're working on getting browser ID everywhere, but we have LDAP everywhere. So, there's only so much dog fooding we can do, but we are dog fooding it. Um, so you know there are some cool things to try. So you can just just link you know, or I said link private.com. Oh, link. So link is like if it's in a link, right? So if if you wanted to do like SEO on your site, so this is actually even better. Link, um, and I just want link intranet.mozilla.org, and no, nobody links to it. So like I could have a link on Cheery. So if if I wanted to do some S, so not SEO, but if I want to see who links to me. I can see the link shiri.com. Oh, look, Planet MySQL links to shiri.com. That's great. There's a Palomino DB blog. That's a company I used to work for that links to shiri.com. Somebody else links to me. So this is in links. You know, Ronald's linking to me in effective MySQL down here. Um, you know, this is what's in the actual like URL of you know the the href when you do it. So that's actually pretty powerful as well. Um, so yeah, so you might want to say in URL to see if Google's indexed it. But even more important. Um, you know what employee is putting stuff on like some web page that they think is not indexed by Google. Um, you know, and numRange also works um, as well. So in URL config.php, right? That would be really useful. Let's see if I have anything like that. Um, in URL shiri.com uh, site shiri.com in URL config.php. And there's no matching documents, because I test all my examples that I put up there before I, I, I should have something that you know, just says, ha ha, this is not a config page, but I don't. So uh, these, are, these are pretty powerful. You can come up with your own. I really like the delete.php. Um, 
more to try. So, you know, it, file type PHP in URL ID and then test out injection. Um, this is interesting. So this colon, star colon star, that's usually like a username and password. So if you, if you do something like this, that's not going to work at all. Keep putting in the URL bar. Um, you know, did you mean this? Well, why yes, let me go ahead and do that. Um, let's see, I probably, this so star colon star. Why is it doing star colon star? It doesn't look like it has a colon in these URLs. Oh, this page colon, oh, I want to do in URL is what I want. So anyway. You, there are some things where you'll have the, there's a username and password in, in, a, uh, in a URL, and that's not, uh, I might need to escape something. At any rate, um, that, that's a good use case for using the stars. There you go. Well, no, that's if, yeah, anyway. Um, this is neat, in title, remote desktop web connection. What do you think might happen if you find a site? I know Shuri.com doesn't have it. Remote desktop is like a Windows, you know, remote desktop, whatever. So, well, we don't want any, so, you know, minus uh, in URL Microsoft, because we don't want any, yeah, remote desktop web. Oh, we want, yeah, oh, in title. Um, yeah, in title. So in title is another one. The title is this thing that appears up here. So if somebody has a remote desktop web connection program, it probably has a default title for the web page there. So you can find, yeah, so here's the remote desktop web connection for this virtual lab. So go to this website, you know, link below. So we go here to this remote desktop and there was a server error because apparently it's not set up properly or I'm blocking pop-ups probably. Um, so it's kind of neat to be able to see, like, is anyone, is somebody at my workplace running this remote desktop web connections to try to get to their, uh, to their work machine when they're not at work? Like, are they trying to bypass security by doing some of these things? Um, so that's kind of a, a neat case as well. Um, further stud study, um, I forget what this is because I did this for a conference last month, so I don't remember what, uh, what I actually connected to. Oh, these are articles. So yeah, four Google searches to run, um, to run on your own company. Um, so one of them is in URL CSOonline.com. What you're looking for is registered domains. Here's the, the colon. Um, you know, in, in title Apache Tomkite error report, that kind of thing. So if you're looking, you want to see an error report because Apache gives a really detailed error report. Uh, here we go. Let's see if we can still get it. Oh, no. It's, it's got a different problem now. There we go. So here's a nice, you know, Apache Tomcat 7.0.2.25 error report. You can see all this nice stuff. And, you know, you can maybe figure out what kind of software they're using, find their vulnerabilities. Um, let's see. So what you're looking for technologies used. This is actually a pretty good article because it explains what you're doing it for. Uh, here's, I, this is probably where I got remote desktop web connection. Um, and then there's uh, Paul.com is a security podcast that is excellent, um, or at least was excellent. I have no idea if they're still, um, still running anymore because I was listening to them a couple years ago. But I hope they are because they're, they're an awesome, awesome podcast. Um, and they have all this stuff, you know, type HTML, Viagra site, your site, um, or teen hardcore site, your site. Um, that's pretty good. Um, for a while, I, I, combat scam, I combat scam a lot. I combat spam a lot. So if you do, um, you know, site www.sherry.com and you look for Cialis, you might actually find something. Nope, good, I'm clean of spam right now. Uh, but it's useful to find because, you know, Man, and if you have like, God forbid you have a wiki on your page or something, it's just a spam magnet. Uh, file type RDP, so again, remote desktop protocol. Uh, file type PST, um, you know, so it basically has a thing, you know, let's teach you how to fit into the throwing salmon at you. Go to this security thing, go to daily web application vulnerabilities, find a good one, read it, come up with a Google search for it. So it's actually pretty cool um, to do. So 
Uh, these slides will be up online somewhere or other, I'm sure. Uh, they are up online because you can actually, um, when, you Google, when I Google search the password, you can find it. So white hat Google hacking, MySQL, I'm sure you can Google for. SecurityVulns.com is this, uh, I think it's actually this, this Russian site, this security.nnov.ru is the same thing. And security, security vulnerabilities. Um, and it's up to date, and it uh, comes out once a week, and it has lots of stuff. So if we find a page for MySQL, can we do it? Can we search for MySQL up here? See, so a MySQL privilege escalation. This was news in 2008. Let's see if we can find something from 2012. There's got to have been something, right? Here you go. In 5.5 allows remote authenticated users. Let's see. Uh, unspecified vulnerability in the MySQL server component in Oracle. MySQL 5.5.x allows remote authenticated users to affect confidentiality and integrity via unknown vectors. Um, isn't it though? That, um, yeah, because Oracle didn't release the details. But you can click through here. So this 495, 496, 494, they're all the same thing. Um, so if, you, if we click on one of these, this is actually something cool. So they have all these descriptions. It's different from the ones that's specified in all these other vulnerabilities. Here's the NVD. Here are the references. So you can actually go to Oracle's site to see the re reference. So it's a critical patch update. Here's Oracle MySQL server. So it also affected all this, you know, Fusion middleware, all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it didn't actually show you. So here, there's a risk matrix. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff. The other thing it does is it has this NVD, this National Vulnerability Database, which is actually quite readable. So there's a link to external sources, and you know, it is confirmed and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff at your fingertips at securityvulns.com, securityvulns.com. Um, and if you're ever bored at work or like you have a job that's like, you know, you're just babysitting a machine and you want to like learn something to get into a better job, um, you know, you could spend your entire day, I mean, I could spend forever on this site just clicking things and looking at the new stuff and, you know, even just for MySQL, there's a ton, as you saw, so. So uh, it's a crazy, crazy world out there. Um, defensive strategies. So what can you do to prevent this stuff? So, so before Google finds it on your site, what can you do? Well, you can validate or scrub your input. Um, you can validate your source so you don't have cross-site request forgery. Um, you want to validate um, all your information so you don't have a cross-site scripting forgery. Um, there's an SQL injection cheat sheet. If you don't know what SQL injection is, it's this. Um, has anyone not seen this? XKCD comic before, raise your hand. Okay. Oh, read it, it's funny. Yeah, particularly this third one. Did you really name your son Robert, quote, you know, parentheses, job table, students, dash, dash? And you know what I haven't put in this? Now you might say, well, who really uses that in the real world? Um, well, hopefully the internet still works. There we go. So I just went to fetch the headers from reddit.com. And it says, OK, it's HTTP 201. Look at the server. So somewhere out there, there's some probably like hacker program where it just like spiders the internet looking for servers and putting the server type in a database so that then you can say, oh, well, this person's using Apache version 1. They're vulnerable. You could do that. And it has a table name of server types. And in fact, if you Google search for drop table server types, you'll actually find um, other people that are doing that. And it's not just like, you know, the Reddit clones out there. Um, it's not, well, it's not because um, it's, on other, it's on other people too. It has the server types. See, I, I couldn't figure, I was trying to figure it out. But like boiled beans has it too, you know, tens. Right.
Right. Right. Right. But at any rate, it is possible. Like, again, it's a double edged sword, sword of, of open source. Um, so, yeah, you know, I hope you've learned to desanitize your database inputs. That's great. Um, that's great for, um, you know, trying to get back at the people who are trying to hack you, is to have something like that where, you know, even if the, it comes back as, oh, you know, there's no, there's no table called server types, they still haven't gotten your server type. They still haven't gotten the fact that you're running Apache 1, so they don't know that you're vulnerable. So the question is, isn't this prevented by using parameterized queries? Yes, however, in MySQL, parameterized queries are compiled once per session. So unless you were doing um, a query like that and using bind variables, right, more than once per session, you're actually doing extra overhead. And if performance is an issue, right, it's this trade-off of performance and security. If you're okay with that extra overhead, then go ahead and do it. Um, but, you know, maybe about five, six years ago, when I, back when I was doing consulting, it was like, you would go to a client site and they would be like, our data, like every single query seems to be really slow. And you'd be like, yeah, you're using parameterized queries. And I'm like, well, they told us that was how to, you know, validate your input and not have any of these problems. Um, most code libraries have ways to validate the input. Um, so, yeah, if you... Why would somebody be doing sessions so often? Because they're not using connection pooling. Um, if they have a very, a site that's very, it doesn't require sticky sessions, for example, in a load balancer, you want something to be, um, you know, highly available, you probably don't want to be too sticky in the load balancer. You know, yeah, if you want something with like a shopping cart where I can see the orders I just put in, that's great, but, you know, who cares if I don't see Josh's Facebook comment to me for another five seconds? You know, so like, Facebook, you know, uses that kind of stuff because they don't really care. Um, you know, it's eventually consistent, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are valid reasons for doing it and not doing it. But, yeah, if parameterized queries works for you, then go ahead and use it. Um, most of the, like, high-performance tips um, out there are stuff that most people probably will never need, right? Like, I'll never need it for Shiri.com. I just don't get that many hits. Um, that doesn't mean I don't do some caching, but, like, I just install the Drupal module that, or WordPress module that does caching for me. Um, I'm not really too worried about it because if somebody really wants to load my article, they'll wait three seconds instead of two. You know, and if I don't sell my article to them, I don't really care. I've lost a reader. Oh well. Like it's not like I make money based on how many people read my article. Um, so there's more another bigger URL so you can read more if you really want. Um, but you know, it's basically if you have something like this. Uh, if the count is greater than zero, log in. This is a really crappy example, but it gives you a sense of it. And so you know, if the if the password is high quote or one equal one, then you say, you know, where username is whatever, Shiri or Foo or whatever, and pass equal high or one equals one. Well, this and pass equal high or one equal one is always going to be yes, because, you know, even if, you know, if your password happens to be high and they're storing it in plain text, then that's poor, but, you know, it'll either accept that or one equals one. Well, that's true, so the whole thing is true. So look for semicolon, backslash, lowercase g, backslash, capital G, uh, quotes, union. Those all are basically ways to kind of try to hack that. Look for HTML encoding. Um, it's something that um, I used to work for a dating site. And we had a guy call and complain. He's like, my, um, my profile isn't showing right. Like, it only has, like, half the de my description. We looked, and he'd started to say something, and he had, like, open bracket, G, close bracket for, like, a grin, I guess. I don't know. He's using some kind of whatever. And so up until that, his profile displayed, you know, it was like, hi, I'm looking for someone to have fun with, you know, angle bracket, capital G, angle bracket. Um, if you also want to have fun, you know, contact me. Well, that whole last part, the, the G, the HTML tag basically for G and, and on was lost. Then we went and we're like, oh, okay, we've restored your profile. We just we made code to escape it and we just escaped it manually for him and then you know worked on code to actually escape it if somebody puts an angle bracket in there. And then we went and searched for the guys who, this is a uh, gay dating site, so they're all guys. Uh, 
Um, we searched for all the guys who had um, angle brackets in their profile, and we found two guys who had some JavaScript in there who were going to like their click for pay site that like every time they get a click, they get like, you know, half a penny or something like that. And we were like, these guys are clever. Like the one guy, you know, was just trying to like make a smiley face or whatever. But these guys are really clever. So obviously we, we put the kibosh on that. Um, but it was, I, I, was, um, I was blown away by how, cle how clever it was. It was like, I never would have thought to do that. Um, look for null or um, car zero, which is uh, the, uh, the null character. Um, these can do things like cause buffer overflows, which are bad. Um, if you're using var car and the empty string, you know, just be careful with things like that. Um, save your, it saves, what, what? Yeah, so if someone's inserting car zero into things, um, you just want to be careful because they might be trying to do something funny. Like if somebody has as their username null, might be, they might be trying to be, because they might have like, you know, they might say like null or, you know, whatever you know, or null plus something, which is gonna end up being null. It's just one of those things that these things shouldn't show up in the normal course of, a, of action. So if they do, someone's either trying to be funny or trying to do something damaging. Uh, but it's not as obvious as like HTML coding is probably something bad. It could also be someone doing it by accident. Um, by validating your input, you also save yourself time. For example, if you validate an email address as such, or an IP address as such, then when you go to use it, you don't have to worry about you know, your, your email address not working because instead of saying escabral at mozilla.com, I gave you escabral at mozilla. Well, that's not gonna be a valid email address. There has to at least be username at something dot something. There might be more dots. There might be a long username. You know, there's, there's a whole you know, um, RFC about what usernames and passwords, uh, usernames and, and host names should look like for email. Um, so you don't necessarily, there are libraries out there to do that for you, but at the very least it should have the format of foo at bar dot something. Um, and it saves yourself time when you're emailing them because you, you know, you'll know that that's not a valid email address. And you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't look like a valid email address. Are you sure that's right? Oh no, it's escabral at mozilla.com. I forgot that. Mm -hmm. The question is the new name your own TLD thing is gonna be a problem? No, because you still have to have a, you still have to have a top-level domain, you know, dot .com, dot .shiri, dot .whatever. Yeah, the, there has to be at least one period in the host name. There has to be an at site. There has to be something followed by an at side, followed by something, followed by dot, followed by something. So there has to be at least one character in all of those things. So it can be like a at b dot c, but it has to at least be in that format. Um, you know, so I'm not saying go ahead and validate the email address and make sure that b.c is a valid thing. I mean, you can do that, but some people think like, that's way too much work. But I'm like, just, just do a regular expression pattern match to see if it matches that. And, and that's at least, you know, part of the way there. Um, you know, you Right, to do a real RFC. And, and here's the interesting thing. Um, I believe that there's something like underscores are not allowed in the host name. In mail, in mail um, MX records, you're not allowed to have an underscore, which um, Microsoft Exchange doesn't actually honor. So I remember back at Tufts, this is you know, 11 years ago at this point, we, uh, we upgraded our system. I think it was from send mail to postfix or something like that, or, or something better, to, something worse to something better anyway. It wasn't postfix, I think it was Postgres to, Ooh, something maybe beginning with an E. Anyway, we upgraded. Yeah, Exim, that's what, that was it, Exim. Um, so we upgraded and uh, all of a sudden people were like, I can't, this person can't email me, or I can't email this person anymore, what gives? And we realized that, so with Microsoft Exchange, you name your server and you're like Shiri's email or whatever, and it converts spaces to underscores. And underscores are not allowed in MX records. So I don't know if that's part of the RFC for email addresses, I know it's part of the RFC for MX records. Um, most of the stuff that I know is because I ran into it as a problem. Like, I don't sit there reading RFCs. Although, if you want to read RFCs, Tom Lomoncelli has compiled a book of the April Fool's Day RFCs that you can buy. And if you don't know who Tom Lomoncelli is and you're in system administration, uh, you're in the wrong business. Go buy any of his books. So, he has a great one called Time Management for System Administrators that is not very long. It's like, you know, 100 or 200 pages. Very good. Anyway, back to security. 
Um, so, you know, you want to avoid things like buffer overflows and you want to make sure that your character set is in line with what you're expecting. Um, in HTML forums, you, give, you have a text box and you're limited to a certain number of characters. You say, oh, input type equals text. You know, length, I think, equals 10. That's 10 characters, but that's not necessarily going to be 10 bytes. So you want to make sure that you don't have those kind of mismatches with MySQL or with any database system. And so you kind of, you know, you're not just validating the user input for a malicious thing, you're also trying to validate it so you don't end up shooting yourself in the foot. That's kind of a side benefit, has nothing to do with security. Trusting get or post. Um, only trust get or post from certain pages. Um, you know, cookies, even with valid session IDs, I mean, people can spoof sessions and all that kind of stuff. So just be wary about how you're doing it. Know that with any kind of saved data, like a cookie or trusting get or post, there is a way to fake that. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use these at all. Um, just because someone can break a window in my car doesn't mean that I never lock my doors and it doesn't mean that I never go out to the mall and park my car there. It means that I lock my doors and I try not to leave anything expensive on the seats um, so that nobody's gonna you know, be tempted to steal anything. But uh, you know, I still go to the mall even though anyone can break my window. And you people say, well, you could spoof a session ID in a cookie. Yeah, but you know, there are certain measures you can take to make it harder. You know, so take those measures and know that you're taking an informed risk and that's it. If you're using PHP, use register globals equals off. Um, this is, you know, very, this is, you, if you were doing PHP 10 years ago, you know this. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of old, old, uh, you know, information um, that's still valid today. Register globals, what that does is it changes a post variable into a get variable. So post variable is a field that's in, um, that's, you know, saved from one web page to another. With get, it's, you'll see it in the URL. So when we saw like question mark ID equals whatever, that's a get variable. Um, you could have also had it in a post variable, which it doesn't show up in, the, in there. But with register globals, it was off. You could put something in the get variable. So you can kind of hack it that way. Or you can say, oh, shiri.com, question ID equals foo, and um, it will read it. So uh, I like to say when, not if. You are going to be hacked at some point in time. Um, somebody's going to have something against you. Um, you just have to figure, you just have to depend on that. I mean, it may not be true, but you have to act as if it's true. Um, you know, I talked about going to the mall and, you know, leaving my car in the parking lot. I drive a Toyota RAV4. My previous car was a Toyota Corolla. Nobody really wanted to steal it. Um, you know, it didn't, it's not like it had like a, you know, I guess I could have made it even more, uh, less desirable to steal by having like a car seat in it for a baby and like having, you know, Cheerios spread everywhere. Nobody wants a dirty car, but, you know, it's, it's not a sexy car. The RAV4 is not a sexy car either. So, um, you know, so, to, so, you know, that's not a sexy car. That's, you know, that's like Shiri.com. It's not really a target. Uh, Mozilla might be a target for hackers, or the Department of Defense is like driving a Porsche. You know, <laughs> like if you work for the Department of Defense, you know, maybe you have a car alarm. Maybe you've like registered your car with the police or with um, LoJack or whatever they call it, you know, to do that. But like, you know, you take more precautions. If you're a bank, you're going to be a target, things like that. But you still, you know, just because just I drive a Toyota RAV4, again, it doesn't mean I don't lock my doors. So one thing to think about is how is your application database access stored? So your application, right, probably has a config file that has the password in clear text. So you might say, well, if somebody wanted to, like, steal all my data, they have to, like, steal my program and steal my database. Well, guess what? If they steal your program, they can steal your database. So that's a tough one. Um, there, are, there are some tools out there to encrypt like your file system and stuff. A lot of people do that with their desktops or laptops. You might want to think about doing that with your, um, with your machine, with your servers as well. It doesn't do anything for employee. Well, it does actually, because it's only the, the application would have the key and you would need the key as well. So yeah, I mean. Well, that's if they can, so the point, the, the point you're making is if someone can log into the file system remotely, um, it's not a big deal. But they would have to have the decryption key. They wouldn't be able to access the file system unless they had that decryption key. Which, I mean, again, the application has to have, so. Hmm? If, if, it, if, if the whole file system has to be known while the application is running, If it's the whole file system has to be mounted, no. The application has the key as well. But the application can store the key somewhere else, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and basically, you're, you're as secure as your most unsecure 
not insecure, that's different. I'm insecure, my programs are unsecure. Uh, it's as strong as your, weak, your weakest link is, right? So a lot of the times, for example, the problem is SQL injection. But why is it SQL injection? Because they didn't validate their data, right? So the question is, is that my SQL being weak or is that the application being weak, like the PHP code or whatever? It's a little bit of both, right? Um, I mean, MySQL has a syntax, so I don't know if you can really blame that on, on the database. It doesn't have to be MySQL, it be Postgres, whatever. Like, it has a database syntax. Um, there are ways that you can say in all the major programs to not allow m multiple queries to your database, meaning you can't put two statements in there. You can't put a semicolon in there. That'll do it for you. So to me, that's kind of the connector, let's say, being weak, because it's allowing that. Um, and there's no vaccine. If you get hit, you know, there's no, there's no way to, like, you know, say, okay, I have a firewall in place and I'm done. Like when you get a vaccine, the idea is you get a shot and you're done. Whether it's for 10 years or for life, you know, you're done. You're, you're good against the disease for a certain amount of time and that per amount of time will be forever. There's no security vaccine. There's no like, okay, I'll just put a firewall in front of it and then I'm done. A lot of people think that. And a firewall is good. It's another door to lock and, and you should do it, but it's not the only thing. There are some regression testing tools. So these are kind of cool. A lot of these are desktop things. So um, let's go to one of them because it's been a while since I've actually looked at them. Um, and they might not work because some of them are kind of old. Um, so let's see, yeah, Gulink, Crap Scan, Smash. Um, I think that's the list I have there. And yeah, these are files and tools, Crap Scan, scans the root directory. And I wish uh, documentation was better. I'm guessing it scans for crap. The question is uh, automate, automating a site search. Oh, so what you could do is you can, so when I say test, when I say regression testing, what I mean is let's say you found Viagra on your site. So now you can save that search in a tool like CrapScan so you don't have to go redo that Google search. Because maybe you had 50 Google searches and three of them had problems. And maybe you're going to add another 50 tomorrow because you know, you're kind of keeping this database. You can use these tools to save your things and say, hey, today do I still have that problem? Then you can start putting it into monitoring systems and all that kind of stuff. Um, so those are, some, those are some nice tools as well to do. And I think I'm getting close to the end of my time and close to the slides. So more actions, there's Google hacking software, there's Google hacks honeypot, which is kind of neat. Um, and just as no Google does honor robots.txt, or at least did at the time of this writing, <laughs> Um, and there are vulnerability checking tools, Gulag, Wikdo, Nikdo. These are things that have uh, Google queries in them. So like CrapScan is stuff where you could save it. These have like libraries of ones that you can just say run against my site. These are the desktop tools actually that I was talking about. Right, so that's a good point. And that may be why I put that on the slide. The point is that Google honors robots.txt, so if you have a very restrictive one, and that's one way that you're kind of trying to be more secure, well, Google honors it, but hackers might not honor it, probably won't honor it. So, you know, don't be like, hey, don't look in this directory called super secret password information, because um, other folks will, will do it. But, you know, and that's also something that you won't find it in your assessment if you're using Google to, to do that. Um, so yeah, I have a podcast, you have a CD in your little plastic bag, that's what that is. I wrote a book called The MyScale Administrator's Bible, there's a whole chapter on security there, and it has none of this information in it. I didn't even talk, I didn't even open the can of worms of Google hacking in that security ch um, chapter. Um, so yeah, anybody have any questions, comments, feedback? List of things to do when you get home. <laughs> so have, going to any presentation on security, if it's good at all, um, is like watching that biology video when you were in high school about like all the bacteria that's on you and then you want to go take a shower. <laughs> it's kind of like that where you're like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta go home and fix some stuff <laughs> or check some stuff, so. Great, well, thank you so much.
cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. 
The gym has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.